Okay, so what we're going to start with today is solids. So we were looking at the properties of gases. We looked at vapor pressure and boiling point, and we looked at the intermolecular forces that are responsible for those. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to transition to solids. And for solids, they're the most prevalent form of matter. And they're probably what we're most familiar with. Um, they have the general properties. And remember that these can vary and that not all solids would display them. But um, generally what we think of as metals, they tend to be hard, inflexible. They're usually lustrous or shiny and they conduct electricity. But we can also have, to kind of contrast that, sort of on the opposite end of the spectrum, we can have things like plastics. And plastics are generally soft and flexible. They can be any color. And they generally do not conduct electricity. Although there is a class of sort of plastics or compounds that do conduct electricity and they're trying to make what they call polymer batteries. Uh, that way, instead of having a battery that has to be a specific shape like a square or a circle or a, I guess really a cylinder like they normally are, you could have your battery be any shape so that you know, your cell phone wouldn't have to be a certain size for the battery. You could just fill in all the nooks and crannies with that battery. And so that's kind of a field of study. So solids, while we're going to talk about them in general, realize that they can vary quite considerably in their properties and things like that. Uh, there's two main categories of solids, or uh, I guess yeah, we can call them categories. There's what we call crystalline solids and what we call amorphous solids. And we're going to almost exclusively talk about crystalline solids for the following reason. In crystalline solids, the atoms are arranged on a 3D lattice, three-dimensional lattice, regularly. So I'm going to just draw two dimensions, but the idea is that the number of atoms and the spacing between the atoms is consistent or constant. And we have a special name for this is we say they possess long range order. Meaning that the, there's a basic unit that's repeated over and over. Basic unit is repeated. Amorphous compounds on the other hand, the atoms are irregular in their arrangement. Arrangement. And they generally vary by either the bond length, meaning the distance between the atoms, or they vary by the bond angle. And so that's that first handout that we kind of Put on, uh, put on to print out. Mostly I care about the second page of that handout, but that sort of shows you what a regular kind of lattice looks like as opposed to an amorphous one. The amorphous one might have some atoms that are out of place in the lattice. It might have some bond lengths that are shorter than others, and it forms basically an irregular array. So they lack that long range order. And there's basically no repeatable unit in them. And so these are relatively easy to visualize. They're relatively easy to talk about because they're very consistent. These are relatively difficult because there is no consistency in them. You start talking about probabilities. You start talking about averages. Or you start talking about an idealized structure that varies a little bit. And so they're really sort of difficult to study. Uh, I did my PhD on amorphous compounds, and I always laugh in hindsight in that the, we decided to title the thesis 
the structure of amorphous compounds, which is kind of like saying the color of gray, which, you know, gray doesn't have a lot of color. Or, you know, the idea is that basically structure and amorphous really don't go together. And so, you know, when you're talking about amorphous compounds, it's realized that when we say structure, we're talking about sort of averages and things like that. But still, it's kind of strange. So we can classify all solids as either crystalline solids or amorphous solids. And amorphous solids tends to be things like plastics and glasses. These things tend to be things that we would consider crystals or uh, minerals or uh, uh, metals. And so we're going to stick with crystals, minerals, and metals. Easy, plastics, and glasses, much more difficult. Even though we can use them in our everyday life, we can measure their properties and you know, all sorts of things like that. It's just that to get a real fundamental understanding of them, it's kind of difficult. Now, both types of solids kind of follow the following classification in that there's four different types of lattices. And what we mean by lattice is that regular three-dimensional network. And what we mean by different types is that there's four different types of bonds. So maybe I should kind of phrase it that way. There's four different types of bonds they can hold those lattices together. And we've talked about three of the four types already. The first type is ionic. And obviously, so this is the name. This is the type of bond. And obviously, ionics are held together by ionic bonds. That's between positive and negative charges. And that's the one we're probably most familiar with, because that's the first type of compounds and molecules that we started talking about. Um, they tend to be characteristics. Because of their regular nature, they tend to be a bit brittle. But they are generally hard with high melting points. And again, these are all things that we've discussed before in that we know that ionic compounds all have these properties. And the reason they have these properties is because they're made up of those positive and negative charges. And they also conduct electricity when they're dissolved in H2O. And of course, our common examples of those is always just NaCl. But basically, any metal, nonmetal pairing is going to make an ionic type of solid. Second class, we've already talked about too. They're made up of molecules, so they're molecular. Here, they're not held together by sharing electrons. That's the molecules themselves, remember. Here they're held together by those intermolecular forces that we talked about. So either London dispersion forces, dipole-dipole interactions, hydrogen bonds. And their characteristics is they generally are considered soft and have low melting points. And that's because, I guess I'll put it in a different color, these make, this is a strong attraction, right? So it makes strong bonds. That's what makes it have the high melting point and to be hard. Whereas these are generally weak compared to ionic ones, so they make weak interactions. And so they tend to be soft and have low melting points. But they're both considered solids. They both form solids. And they both are you know, examples or representatives of this class. Uh, the last part would be that they're non-conducting. Meaning they don't break apart into ions. They stay as molecules. And examples of this are, for instance, just water, CO2, or basically any time we have a nonmetal, nonmetal stuck together. An example of the two different classes are the models that we have up here. For instance, if you take a look, this is an example of sodium chloride, where we would either have sodiums on the corners and one chlorine atom in the middle, or you can think about it in the opposite way: the chlorines on the corners, and sodium. And then they're held together by that positive and negative force. This is an example of a molecular crystal where this is actually what water looks like when it forms ice. So this is a structure of ice. It's kind of neat, I think, because it's got all those little hexagons in it. It's a fairly regular, well-ordered structure. And if you take a look at the model carefully, you'll notice that each of the oxygens has um, two, two hydrogen bonds put out. 
And then what these purple bonds represent is the hydrogen bonds that are being formed from each of these oxygens. And so the real structure is being held together by the hydrogen bonds between these water molecules. So when we talk about a molecular crystal, we have to kind of differentiate that we're not talking about the bonds between the water atoms. For instance, if I have an H, an O, and an H, we're not talking about the fact that these share electrons. That's talking about the bond. When we're talking about the lattices or the crystals, we're saying that one, ox or one water molecule is attracted to the next water molecule via those hydrogen bonds. And so there's my hydrogen bond. That's what we're talking about oops, when we talk about what's holding together the different molecules. And so if you think about it, for an ionic compound, the lattice is made up of sodium plus, chlorine minus, sodium plus, chlorine minuses. But for a molecular one, each of the points is going to be an H2O molecule. And so we actually have molecules at what we would consider the points of that lattice. I ran out of room, so we'll just kind of continue our table. Number three are covalent networks. And let's see, what order did I have things in? Oh, the type of bond. These are actually covalent bonds, meaning we share electrons. And the idea is that some compounds, when they form covalent molecules, for example, like water, that's a discrete molecule, meaning there's just a single water that can be floating around. Some compounds, though, like for instance diamond or glass, um, SiO2 glass specifically, these tend to form lattices. So one of the things we said early in the semester is that ionic compounds form lattices, Molecular compounds form molecules. Well, that was mostly true. Most molecular compounds simply form molecules. There are a small number of molecular compounds that form these covalent networks. And so that means that the sharing of electrons is what's actually occurring. Of course, I've already put down, oh, these are generally hard. And they generally have high melting points for solids. So even though they're covalent, they have the, hard, or the high melting points because sharing electrons is still a strong attractive force compared to, for instance, the intermolecular forces like London dispersion forces holding molecular compounds together versus you know, hy even hydrogen bonds. The sharing of electrons is a lot more. And of course, I've already put down the two examples. That would be diamonds and, for instance, SiO2, meaning that a diamond is a three-dimensional network of carbon atoms that are all bonded together to form a molecule or a, a lattice. So, you know, these are really almost like the ionic ones in that respect, in that there's atoms at each of the corners. The last one we're going to talk about is metallic, and that's the one that we're not going to say a whole lot about, mostly because metallic compounds are much more complicated than any of the other three sets of crystal structures and compounds. We can talk about the type of structures they make, but we can't talk about too many of the details. And they're held together by what are called metallic bonds, which we haven't talked about. But this is basically, there's a sea of electrons that are capable of moving. Well, that you know, there's basically a sea of electrons around it. And so the idea is that if I take a look at a metal like, say, iron, then I've got a bunch of iron atoms. But they're not sharing electrons. So there's no sharing, per se. There's no ions, meaning there's no plus and minuses. And what there really is is there's a sort of a loose bath of electrons that are able to flow anywhere in these metals. So metallic bonds tend to have sort of tend to be hard. They tend to have high melting points and boiling points, just like we'd expect for all the metallic elements on the uh, periodic chart. And they also conduct electricity naturally, meaning in the metallic state. Whereas, for instance, if we're talking about things like sodium chloride, which are ionic compounds, 
then they tend to conduct electricity only when dissolved in water, whereas metals just conduct electricity naturally due to that sea of electrons. Generally, metallic bonding and conductivity and all of the properties of metals like that are usually left to like a three or four hundred level class because the mathematics that describe it are sort of complicated. Okay, so we've got those four types of networks and again we're going to focus not so much on details of any individual compound but sort of in broad generalities in this class. So we have what we can call the unit cell. What this is, is this is the smallest repeatable unit of a crystal. So one of the things we said is that crystals have that long range order. And what that means is that there's one small element of it that's kind of repeated over and over and over and over again in a regular array. It turns out that there's 14 different cell structures, different unit cells, but we're going to limit ourselves for the discussion to the three most common cubic lattices. And what we mean by cubic lattice is that they are, have 90 degree angles and they have equal sides. So, for instance, if you take a look at the models that I have sitting up in class, you'll notice that there's three of them that look like cubes here. They literally look like squares, right? And, you know, for instance, the water molecule here, that's got that hexa hexagonal shape. So that's one of the other 14 basic types of cell structures. But the mathematics for this is hard. The angles are complicated. You have to do a lot of geometry to get anything to use a lot of them. Squares are pretty darn easy. And the idea is that if you understand the concepts behind a square, or behind the square lattices, then what you're going to do is you're going to understand or be able to apply those concepts to more complicated geometries to add to them. Now, if you're not going on and doing physical chemistry or going on and getting a degree in uh, material science or something, you'll probably never have to use or deal with the more complicated unit cells. But it's nice to know that that information is out there to, uh, you know, that it's something, it's just basically like an extrapolation of something that you would already know. So the three different types of unit cells that we're going to talk about are simple cubic, and I abbreviate that SC all over the place. We have body-centered cubic. Can you guess what we abbreviate that as? BCC. And we have face-centered cubic. And we call that just FCC. And I'm not very good at drawing pictures. So that's why you guys have this handout. So go ahead and grab that handout if you kind of want to follow along at what we're looking at. Also realize your book is chock full of awesome pictures. What you're going to have to deal with is my drawing skills and, you know, sketching them out. But really, if you look at the pictures, it's not too hard to see. So a simple cubic simply has the atoms at the corners of a cube. So if you draw a three-dimensional shape in your notes, you know, you have something like that. And what we're saying is that at each of these corners, we have an atom. Also, I think, honestly, looking at the three-dimensional models at the front of class, which you should be able to see from where you're sitting, it's pretty easy to kind of see it. So if we take a look at that, there's some characteristics we can talk about it. First of all, there's one atom per unit cell. Now that sounds weird, right? Because I said there's eight atoms, right? One on each of the corners of the cube. But how much of each atom is actually inside the cube? So if you look at it, there's eight corners. But there's only one eighth of an atom 
in each corner. And so really then there really is only one atom per cell. So even though we draw a picture with eight atoms in it, realize that when we're talking about the amount of space it occupies, there's really only one atom per cell in that. We can also talk about their coordination numbers. So, oops, I guess we should define it first. Coordination numbers. And for this, it's going to be six. And this is basically the number of atoms in contact. Meaning if you imagine a set of spheres and then you imagine another set of spheres on top of it, that means that each sphere is surrounded by six other spheres. And so depending upon the, the cubic structure, there's going to be a different number of atoms like that. And then the last thing we want to talk about is the space filling. And this uses up 52% of the available space, meaning that in a cubic lattice, 50 or 48% of the space is empty. So it's not a very efficient form of packing for the atoms. And if you go and you look at the different metals and the different how they, they stack differently, it all comes down to basically the size versus charge form. We're not going to worry about the trends in it, but essentially, depending upon the size of the atom and the charge of the atom, that kind of tells you how close they want to get together for various things. So we can also have a body centered cubic that has atoms at the corners again. But now it has an atom at the center too. And so that's that second picture or kind of the middle one in the handout I gave you. If we try to sketch a picture in your notes just for reference. You know, we've got atoms at the corners again. And the idea is that I have got one atom in the center. And so what that means is there's really two atoms per unit cell because I've got eight corners times an eighth of each atom is in the cell. So that's just considered one atom. And then, of course, I've got one in the center. And that counts as one since that's entirely in the cell. And so I get two atoms. And if I take a look at the coordination number, that one's pretty easy to see because in the unit cell you get to see all of the atoms. So you can tell that if I kind of blow this atom up and consider that all the atoms are big enough to touch each other, then it's going to touch the four on top of it, right? And it's going to touch the four on the bottom of it. And so it's going to have a coordination number of eight. Whereas here it's a little harder to see for the simple cubic lattice why it has a coordination number of six, although if you kind of extend the lattice, you can say that it's one, two, four, five, and then one above it. And so you can see how many atoms are touched. And that's important for when we kind of, well, most of these sort of characteristics of the unit cells are going to be important because what it's going to allow us to do is measure the distance between the atoms and or calculate the density of atoms or of various compounds based simply on knowing their unit cell structure. So this is really sitting down and saying, Okay, what does an atom or a molecule really look like? We looked at that in terms of molecular compounds for Lewis structures and looking at bond angles and stuff. Now we're saying what happens when we form a solid out of these compounds, how do they arrange themselves? So it has a coordination number of eight, and then it fills up to 68% of the space. The last one is face centered cubic. Here we have atoms at the corners. And then we have an atom at each space. And I've got to be honest, here's where Jay's drawing skills probably totally are going to fail. So if we try to draw a three-dimensional structure, so again, we have atoms at each of the corners. And then what we're saying is that I've got an atom on each face of that cube. And I only drew a couple of them. I didn't draw all six even because, well, my drawing skills aren't very good. And so that means in this case there's actually four atoms per unit cell. There's, again, the ones at the corner. So there's one-eighth of an atom, or I'm sorry, there's eight corners, 
and one eighth of each atom is in the corner, so that gives me one total. And then, of course, there's six faces. And if you take a look at the picture, you can see that only half of each atom is in the face. So if you kind of take this face center cubic structure here, that's this one right here, you can see that if you kind of look down that angle, then you know, half the atoms are in this cell over here, half the atoms are considered to be in this cell. And so half of each atom is sort of in each different cell. And so we get six faces times half an atom. That gives us three. So then, you know, one and three is four. And then if we kind of look at the coordination number, here we're getting higher and higher coordination numbers. And we have a coordination number of 12. That means each atom is actually physically in contact with 12 surrounding atoms. And this is also the most efficient filling of space in that it fills up 74% of the space in the models. So you can read in your book about some of the details about which types of crystals tend to be formed by what types of atoms. Uh, also, the book will talk about something called hexagonal closest pact. We can kind of ignore that and instead simply focus on the three main ones here. And then what this is all leading to is we want to do some mathematics. Or I guess maybe let's take a look at a little bit of geometry. Now, you don't have to memorize this. You will get these formulas. And in fact, you'll get this sheet right here with the crystal structure lattices on the uh, test. But we kind of want to take a look at it and kind of think about it. And what this is going to be useful for calculating is we can calculate densities. We can calculate cell lengths. And we can also calculate the atomic radius of different atoms this way, or different crystal structures. And so if we take a look at the easiest one, that's our simple cubic model, then if I take a look at just a small portion of it, meaning one face of it, what we realize is that I've got an atom at each corner. And I've been drawing them as little points, but realize that we really kind of think about them as being spheres that are touching. So I've got one sphere here and one sphere here and one up above, and one right there. And so if you look at it, if I define the side length, or as A, then, and of course, the radius of an atom as R, there's a very simple, oops, I should use a lowercase r, there's a very simple relationship. So notice that this is simply the radius of one atom. This is simply the radius of another atom. And that, that whole thing is what we're defining as A as our side length. And so we know that the side length for a cubic cell is simply twice the radius. Now, as you can tell, for looking at the other pictures and looking at the other geometries involved, for instance, for a body-centered cubic, well, That's, again, got that square lattice. But remember, there's an atom in the center. And of course, I'm drawing something in two dimensions instead of three. And so notice that if I've got one atom there and one atom here and one atom here, that you know here's the radius of my atoms. Well, they don't touch anymore. And so we can't use a simple formula to determine the side length to radius ratio. Instead, what we actually have to do is take what's called a body diagonal. And that means take one corner of it and go to the opposite corner. That way you go through an atom, this atom in the middle, and the atom on the side. And we can finally, through a bunch of mathematics, realize that A is simply 4R over the square root of 3. So again, don't memorize that. that page that I handed out is going to be given on the test. You just have to know how to manipulate it. And then for face centered cubic, that one's not too bad. That simply ends up being A equals the square root of 8 times R, meaning those atoms aren't touching each other because there's one atom that's on this face of each one. And so if you kind of look at it, you know, there's a part of it, there's a part of it, then you've got to factor in that atom in the middle. And again, that's all geometry. And I don't want to get bogged down in the geometry. What I want you to be able to do is know that you have this formula available to us and go ahead and do things. <coughs>
The other thing that we're going to do since we're calculating density is sort of review density for a second. What was density again? It's just the mass over the volume. And the way we're going to think about it is to calculate the mass of an atom or a unit cell, we need to know the number of atoms per cell, and we also need to know the molecular weight. But that's pretty easy because we know the molecular weight of all the most all the metals, and if we know what lattice or cubic structure they're in, then we also know the number of atoms per cell. And then figuring out the volume in a density is simply geometry. We know that if I know the radius, or if I know the side length is equal to r, well then that just means the volume is equal to r cubed. And so if I know that for a simple cubic, a equals 2r, well I happen to know then that the volume is equal to a divided by 2 cubed. That's an a, not a 9. Or for instance, for a body-centered cubic, if I know that a equals 4r over the square root of 3, well, that also implies that r is equal to a times the square root of 3 all over 4. Well, that means that my volume, if that's r cubed, is just a square root 3 all over 4 cubed. And we can simplify that expression if we really want, but it's usually I usually simply calculate r and plug that in and not the actual formulas for stuff. So the idea is that by knowing this information, either the number of atoms per unit cell, the molecular weight, and the geometry, if I know any, say, three out of those four pieces of information, also including density, then that means I can calculate the missing one. So we'll do two examples of that, one of which will certainly appear on an exam. So for instance, if I take gold, that crystallizes in a face-centered cubic structure with a density of 19.3 grams per centimeter cubed. And so notice that I know the density. I know the uh, cell structure. That means that what I can do is I can calculate the missing piece of information, which is what is the atomic radius of an AU atom. Meaning, how big is a single gold atom? And for units, we generally use picometers because that gives us a nice number, usually between 1 and 100 for the size of an atom. Meaning, the size of an atom is on the order of a picometer. A picometer is on the order of what, 10 to the minus 12 meters. So, you know, atoms are pretty small. We could simply report our answer out in meters. Heck, we could report it out in inches, but we don't have a good feel for things like that. And so we tend to pick a unit, for instance, in this case, picometers, that gives us a nice kind of smallish number. So we've got density equals mass over volume. Well, I already know my density. That's 19.3 grams per centimeter cubed. I can figure out my mass because I know it's face-centered cubic, which means there's four atoms per cell. I also know the molecular weight of gold because I always get my periodic table, so that's 197.0 grams per mole. And so that means that the only thing left to calculate is I don't know my volume. So if I go ahead and do some math, I know that I have four atoms per cell. So this is kind of a mass calculation. And I know that there is one mole is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. And I know that there is 197.0 grams per mole. Notice that my atoms cancel out, my moles cancel out, and I'm just left with a unit of grams per cell, meaning what we are calculating is the mass of just one tiny part of the crystal. So we're just saying instead of calculating the mass of you know, thousands or millions or billions or 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms, simply calculating the mass 
And so we should expect, you know, since gold has a lot of atoms, that the mass per unit cell is pretty tiny. If you plug this into your calculator, I hope you get 1.31 times 10 to the minus 21 grams per unit cell. And then if I look at that, I can also say, well, I know that volume is equal to mass divided by density. That's just rearranging my uh, density formula. So we know that that's 1.31 times 10 to the minus 21 grams per cell. And we know that the density is 1. Oops, I'm sorry, 19. 0.3 grams per centimeter cubed. And so notice my grams cancel out, and so I can figure out the volume of a cell, which is 6.79 times 10 to the minus 23 centimeters cubed. So again, you know, small mass because, well, atoms are small, so it also has a small volume. And then because I know it's face centered cubic, I know that A equals 4R over the square root of 3. And I also know that volume is equal to R cubed. Actually, do I have that right? Not the radius. It's equal to A cubed is what I mean. So, you know, remember we defined A as being that cell length. And so if I know my volume is 6.79 times 10 to the minus 23 centimeters cubed, and that's equal to A cubed, well, the easiest way to do that is to take the cubic root of each side. And so I simply get A equals 4.08 times 10 to the minus 8 centimeters. I also know that A is equal to, oops, I lied. Face centered cubic, I have the wrong formula here. Sorry, A is equal to the square root of 8R. Did I put that for the, oh, I didn't put the formula down on the previous one. Good. So, sorry, I copied, I wrote down the body centered cubic formula. I meant to write down face centered cubic. So make sure you kind of go and fix that. So A is equal to the square root of 8R. So we can figure out that R is equal to uh, 1.4, oops, 1.44 times 10 to the minus 8 centimeters. And, you know, that's a perfectly legitimate answer for the radius of something. But, again, we said that we wanted to do uh, it in picometers. So I'm going to convert from centimeters to meters. And then I'm going to convert from meters to picometers. And if I do that, I get 144 picometers. So that gives us a nice number between, you know, one in a hundred or one in a couple hundred. Meaning, if I say that something is 144 picometers and I say that something else is 200 picometers, you can tell me which one's bigger, right? Whereas if I say that something is 1.44 times 10 to the minus 8 centimeters and something else is, you know, 10 times, or, you know, 1.00 or something times 10 to the minus 9 picometers, those exponents, that minus 8, minus 9 part, it's hard to get a good feel for the size, whereas the difference between 144 and, say, 100 or 200 is pretty easy to tell. So think about the process that's being used here. Think about you know, what information you have and what formulas you're doing. Because essentially, all the problems are the same in that you have the same amount of information. It's just which ones of these pieces you're missing is going to change a little bit what the math you're doing. So, for instance, in this, in this question, we ask what the side length is. Well, we can do a similar question where instead we say, for instance, silver is a face-centered cubic lattice also with an edge length or a cell length equal to 408.7 picometers. So notice gold form something that has a cell length of 144 picometers, but silver, similar compounds, same crystal structure, it has a cell length of 408.7 picometers. And so what we can ask is simply, what is 
the density of silver. And of course, we tend to measure density in grams per centimeter cubed. Now, I have to admit, you can go and look that up on the cheat sheet. You can just write the answer down. But really, what I grade on is the mathematics involved in getting the answer, plus what happens if on the test I give you an example that isn't on the cheat sheet. You have to do it. Now, if I do give you an example that's on the cheat sheet, you have a built-in double check, don't you? Because you can just look the answer up. So again, you know, we take a look at our information. I've got density equals mass over volume. Well, I know that face centered cubic is four atoms per cell. I also know the molecular weight of silver because I've got my periodic table. So it's 107.87 grams per mole. And here I almost know the volume because I know that A is equal to 408.7 picometers, and I know that for a face-centered cubic, A is equal to the square root of 8R, and I know that basically volume is simply R cubed, so that really just means it's A divided by the square root of 8 cubed. So what I have to do is I just have to calculate those two parts, and so there's kind of two steps to it. So I'll do the first step. That's simply calculating the mass part of it. We know that the mass is going to be the number of atoms per unit cell. We know that we need to get rid of atoms, so we're going to use Avogadro's number again. And we know that we're going to use our molecular weight, which is 107.87 grams per mole. So moles cancel, atoms cancel. I just get 7.16 times 10 to the minus 22 grams per unit cell. So notice that I'm always using Avogadro. I'm always using a molecular weight, and I'm always using the number of atoms per cell, or I guess this is the cell type, we'll call it, because that changes, right? So again, for mass, it's always the same three steps. And if you happen to be missing one of those steps, like if I don't tell you what type of cell it is, then you have to you know, fill in that step and by solving for all the other parts. Volume is a little bit more complicated. We know it's A cubed, and we know that A is equal to the square root of 8R. Therefore, we know that volume is equal to uh, R divided by the square root of 8 cubed. And so what we know is that if A is equal to 408.7 picometers, actually, we don't even need to know half that information. We don't even need to know the radius parts. We just need to know that volume is A cubed. And we need to get picometers, but we need to go to centimeters. So because we want the grams per centimeter cubed. So one picometer is one times 10 to the minus 12 meters. One times 10 to the minus two meters is one centimeter. That's just our normal conversions. So we know it's 4.087 times 10 to the minus eight centimeters. So A is that. A cubed is then simply 4.087 times 10 to the minus 8 centimeters cubed, which is 6.827 times 10 to the minus 23 centimeters cubed. And then, of course, the third step is we simply know that density is equal to mass over volume. That was step one. That's step two. So all I have to do is take my numbers, 7.16 times 10 to the minus 22nd grams and divide by 6.827 times 10 to the minus 23 centimeters cubed. We don't even really need a bar problem for that. And we get 10.49 grams per centimeter cubed. And of course, if we double check our cheat sheet, then we kind of already know that we've got that answer right. If I remember right, it's really 10.5 on the cheat sheet. So there's even one less significant figure.
And I guess if I was looking at it, I can't remember. I guess I have at least four sig figs everywhere because my length was four sig figs. So I can calculate my density to four significant figures. So what you need to be able to do then is understand sort of the mathematics and the relationships that are going on behind those crystal structures to do the math part of it. What I want you to also have is an understanding of the four different basic types of crystals, meaning molecular, covalent, ionic, and metallic. Know the general properties of them so that, you know, if you, someone gave you some information, you'd be able to make a logical statement about it. And then really kind of have just a little bit of understanding of the difference between amorphous and crystalline. And so this is homework 10D. We're going to say that's due, today's what, Tuesday? So that's due on Thursday. So if we're looking at our week, today's Tuesday. So we've got Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So this was 10 B and C. This is going to be 10 D is due. And what we'll do is tomorrow in class, we'll lecture on the 10 E homework. And then we'll start in on chapter 9 on gases. And since you weren't here yesterday, Gabriel, um, what we decided is that we're not going to have a lab. We're just going to kind of do lectures because we've got two chapters in two weeks. And so there's really not time to do a lab if we want to cover all the lecture material like we should to make sure we end up where we should for the semester. So we'll call it quits there and uh, pick up talking about the last part of chapter 10. And then we'll probably start in on chapter 9. So let's see, we need to shut this off.